I want to take time to introduce Caitlin Costello. I've worked with her many times down at UCSD, and she is phenomenal. She's going to go into release therapy and clinical trials. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And Caitlin, take it away. Thank you, Kelly. I am just so honored to be here today again with you. I think the last time we were together a couple of years ago, this is just something I always look forward to every year, and I'm, I'm just grateful for the opportunity and, and really enjoyed listening to Dr. Cole. He left really big shoes here and set the bar pretty high for me, so I hope that um, I will be able to teach you a little something just the same. So without further ado, we'll talk about relapse therapy and no better day than today with this exciting news about the first BCMA CAR T uh, cell therapy being approved um, for the treatment of relapse refractory multiple myeloma. I saw several questions in the chat about CAR T and I'll try and answer some of those as well so that I can make sure everyone is up to speed on the new exciting thing that literally just happened before we signed on today. So let's move forward here and say, gosh, if I had only known when I wrote this title last week that the future is now, it truly is now. I mean, we really have been anxiously kind of awaiting for some of these new drugs to come through and, and today is the day. So I, I figure it's important to kind of lay the groundwork a bit when thinking about, you know, treatment for relapse, refractory multiple myeloma. And, and there's lots to consider for you and for your doctor. Um, some of the things I think about when I'm trying to um, come up with a good kind of cocktail, if you will, or whatever it is that we need for patients if their myeloma has started to misbehave again some of the things that I think about and make sure to have conversations with my patients is think about, okay, what therapies are you on? What have you been on? How well did they work? How long did they work? You know, what kind of side effects have you previously had? Um, what are the logistical considerations in terms of can you take a pill or do you need to travel for work or do you need to... Um, do you have difficulties getting into the infusion center? Are IV medications okay? You know, and multiple myeloma has been a bit of an embarrassment of riches, honestly, because there are just so many options available now for the treatment of multiple myeloma that sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming in terms of thinking about what is the next best treatment for me. And if you're confused, it's confusing. There's just so many good things to do. So I hope I hope today will help to um, clarify a little bit of what goes through your doctor's mind, at least when we're trying to come up with the next newest and greatest for you. Um, but things that I want to make sure that you are armed with, with your questions when you go to your doctor's appointment in order to think about um, what questions that you should be asking. So let's talk a little bit about multiple myeloma and think about how they, um, how the relapses happen. So, you know, multiple myeloma, I really think of it as a marathon. I mean, we're in it for the long haul here, and our goal is that it is, well, exactly that long. How about multiple myeloma in terms of the way that it comes and goes is that, you know, as you can see over on the far side of this graph here, multiple myeloma when it first starts can oftentimes begin as an MGIS. So that's a monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. So when you think about where someone first was diagnosed with myeloma, well, it didn't happen overnight. We know that there was something that was in the background that was been kind of percolating over time. What that time frame means, we don't really know, but let's say it didn't happen yesterday. It's probably been there for months, if not years, trying to develop. Once it finally rears its head and you get all the good therapies that Dr. Cole talked about, maybe with a transplant, we hopefully get you into remission so that someday it's going to come back. And when it comes back, that's what we're talking about. How do we deal with it? Because we want to make it go back into remission away. It's like whack-a-mole. Something comes up, you smack it right back down again. How can we make that next remission be as durable as possible? Because one of the concerns is that when myeloma recurs each time that it does, it may be that the remission times kind of get shorter and shorter. Maybe it's because the myeloma is becoming a little more aggressive. Maybe it's smartening up a little bit. Maybe it's trying to figure out how to say, you know, oh, yes, I've seen that Revlimid before, or I've seen that Velcade before. Yeah, not going to work. It's kind of like antibiotic resistance, really just for a, a very simplistic um, comparison. 
that ultimately you can see with those kind of funny pictures here. If you think about, you have all these kind of purple cells as part of the myeloma. Well, that's just one part of the myeloma that maybe we can put to sleep with Revlimid or we can put to sleep with um, a transplant. And, but maybe that means that the next time it comes back, some of these blue parts of the myeloma are a part that had previously been kind of dormant or kind of laying quiet. Maybe that starts coming to life where ultimately you're getting these very resistant um, multiple myeloma clones that um, over time may end up being not as responsive to the treatment. And so again, as I mentioned, when you're thinking about relapse, the things that I'm thinking about when I see you is, okay, how much myeloma is there? When people relapse, they relapse differently. Patients sometimes can find that their myeloma comes back slowly. Maybe your M spike has been kind of trickling along at 0.1, and the next time you check it's 0.2, and the next time you check it's 0.3. And over the course of many months, and sometimes even longer, you may find this what we call biochemical progression, where you see that this just very slow incremental increase in the disease. That can be very different from someone whose myeloma goes from 0.1 to 1.0 to 1.5. So it's really important to recognize how quickly your myeloma is changing. That's that M spike that Dr. Cole was mentioning. This is critical. It's important to know that 80% of people have an M spike, but for you people out there that just have a kappa or a lambda, you most likely don't have an M spike and that's okay. We'll watch your light chains just the same. So first I think about is, how quickly do I need to make a move? How bad, how quickly is the myeloma growing? How at risk are you for that myeloma causing a new bone problem or causing new kidney failure or, or causing worsening anemia? These are all the things that make me understand how long I can sit in my hands and how quickly I need to intervene. When I'm trying to think about you know, treatments of what I want to give to you, I'm gonna look at your kidney function. I'm gonna see if your kidneys are well. Can they tolerate medications that may be slightly harder on them? Or how is Murdad, you mentioned your neuropathy. I have to be so careful not to give you a medication that's gonna cause neuropathy. Um, or I, maybe I say that, heck, that Revlimid worked so well for so long for you at some point. Maybe we go to a similar drug like that and hope we get the same bang for our buck out of it. So. There's lots of things that we consider when we're trying to come up with your next best treatment. And oh, that embarrassment of riches. I had to actually add on last week, melflufen onto this list. And had I known today was definitely gonna be the day I would have added on CAR T, but look at this. I mean, I, I've been around long enough to see you know, uh, at least half of these be approved at this point. Um, and it's just such a wonderful luxury we have. The FDA has just been so good to us in terms of giving us options. You know, we'll talk a little bit about how good those options are and when the right times are to use them. But as this has become a marathon, as, as Dr. Cole mentioned, that patients are living so much longer, this is the reason. If we can keep myeloma at bay, I, what I usually say, let's kick the can down the road as long as we can until the next newest and greatest comes out that's maybe going to be that cure. I'm very hopeful that in my lifetime, we are going to see a cure. And it's because of things like CAR-T getting approved today that that's a real possibility. So the best thing we have going for us is that we have options. So when we think about what our kind of most common treatment plan is, is we oftentimes say, all right, we need two or three drugs. Let's put them all together. Let's add dexamethasone to that bunch. So we ultimately are going to have, um, you know, so many different cocktails that you're going to work your way through. But again, then the FDA is going to come up with the next new thing. And we're going to be able to say, all right, I got my next trick up my sleeve. So here we go. So treatment goals. So this is an important part of this. Think about your goals in terms of what it is that you want to accomplish when your myeloma comes back. It's different for everybody. Everyone has different goals. It may be that um, your goal is to carry on working and traveling when we used to do that, hopefully soon again, you know, and, and you need to get on the plane and you need to get, um, you know, somewhere. So you got to take your pills with you or you're retired and you're planning to hop in that RV and, and explore the country. Well, it's hard to do that when you're connected to an IV every couple of weeks or every week, whatever that may be. Um, so one thing to consider, 
There are other people that say, I will do whatever it takes to live as long as possible. You know, there are various um, um, quality of life considerations that are, are possible here is to say, I don't want to spend my time, whatever that may be, in an infusion center. Or I need to understand that myeloma, my myeloma is kind of exploding before my eyes. Now's the time where we just need to stop get going, get treatment in before any more damage is done. So really need to figure out how all of these different considerations um, kind of inter interplay and overlap so that we can find the best treatment for you. So how do we do that? So I know you all talked a lot about different blood work that is done at diagnosis and the way that we would monitor you throughout your um, treatment course before and during and after a transplant if you do that. But much of what we do is monitoring. After you've had your treatment, and if you're still on treatment and we're observing you while you're taking your Revlimid maintenance, for example, um, depending on how patients are do that, I do that at some interval between up to one, probably not any less often than every three months for patients who've been on Revlimid for you know a number of years for their maintenance. But the things that I follow is the CBC, so I want to make sure that your white blood cell count and your red blood cell count and your platelets are all behaving. Sometimes Revlimid can push those numbers down, but when myeloma relapses, you can become more anemic as well. The chemistry panel is a way for me to watch your kidneys and watch your liver function and make sure your electrolytes are all um, in the normal area as well. Um, calcium, remember that crab criteria we talk about? Well, calcium is that thing we need to kind of keep tabs on because if we see that calcium level starting to inch its way up, that tells us that patients are potentially relapsing just the same. So you really want to get an understanding of just how much the myeloma is growing in your body, but also how is it affecting your body. So that is kind of routine blood work that we look at. But the myeloma panel is a separate blood test. So make sure you understand that, you know, someone had asked about routine blood work. Your average blood test that your primary care doctor, before, you know, does for you before you were ever diagnosed does not include quantitative immunoglobulins and the M spike test and the free light chains. Honestly, it was just until someone finally thought about that as being a possibility that, that they ordered those too. But now once we know that you have it, that's the opportunity to have for us to kind of keep tabs on it because you really want to trend it. You want to watch and make sure that it goes down the right way, that it stays down as we want it to, and that um, we're keeping tabs on it if we're trying to see that it's um, misbehaving. And when you're thinking about um, you know, 24-hour urines, I, I know Dr. Cole had mentioned it. I guess I, I, I do agree with him. There are times and place in order for me to understand you know, if your myeloma has grown to a point where it's affecting your kidneys when protein levels um, start um, increasing in your urine. It tells me your kidneys aren't working as well. Um, so there's a time and a place for checking 24-hour urines also. Now, remember, the hope at relapse is that we catch it before any damage is done. And that's why it's so critical to watch your M spike. What my job is really to do as best as I can prevent new bone problems from forming or new calcium problems or new hit, um, anemia, whatever that may be. Sometimes it's hard to catch it. But when you are found to have relapse, when it's found their M spike or your light chains are starting to rise, it's certainly an opportunity to reevaluate, kind of take a step back and let's just kind of take a big full picture again in terms of thinking about um, where the myeloma may be mis misbehaving. Now, skeletal survey was that kind of old fashioned way where we would take x-rays, like 28 of them of, you know, every bone in your body. And the radiologist would, you know, turn their head sideways and squint at it a little bit and say, oh yeah, maybe I see a little something there. But um, I really would say that skeletal surveys are a way of the past now. And um, it probably was good to find bone problems about 60% of the time, but I'm not okay with 60% of the time. I need, I need more sensitive, more accurate pictures of your bones. So, um, you know, at least here at UCSD, we offer whole body low dose CT scans. We can do whole body MRIs. Um, I love to do PET scans as well. Your insurance doesn't love me to do those. Um, but you know, it's a way for me to kind of look at your, um, whole body, um, and not only potentially see old lesions and how they've healed, but new lesions, if any have developed. And then bone marrow biopsy, everyone's favorite. I know we just torture you so with these bone marrows, but it's important. 
It really does give us helpful information. It's a way for us to assess the clone. Has it changed at all? You know, we you probably talked about mutations beforehand. As the myeloma becomes more resistant and relapses, we can see that it changes and new um, mutations may occur. And what we what we hopefully will see is that um, those mutations will um, someday have a treatment that particularly fixes those mutations. Now we do have it in, in one particular drug called venetoclax for patients who have a translocation of the 11th and the 14th chromosome. But um, and but. But that's the only one for the meantime. But we're very hopeful, like with many other cancers, that there are mutations that are going to be um, uh, found, that we have very specific targets or medications to fix. So all of these are the critical things that should be done at relapse. So we can really take a step back and take a new look at your myeloma and see how anything has affected your body or how the myeloma has changed. So we kind of mentioned this a little bit. So there, if you break it down into three kind of specific ca categories, these are the things worth thinking about. So let's think about your disease specifically. So when I'm thinking about your new therapy for you, I'm going to look at your disease, as I mentioned, say, is it exploding before my eyes? Do I need to act fast? Because the faster it comes back, the faster we need to act before it causes any significant compromise. But as I mentioned, if it's a slow biochemical progression, maybe we can watch it for a little while and try and find the exact right minute to intervene. There is no M spike that I say, we absolutely have to intervene at this point. I really look at the trends. Technically, there are criteria that say if your M spike increases an absolute value of 0.5 or 25%, that tells us that it is meets criteria for progression. Um, but I think it's important to understand the nature of the relapse. And as we mentioned, risk stratification, right? So if we do your bone marrow biopsy and we look to find if there's any high risk chromosomal abnormalities, like particularly written there, deletion 17P, translocation of 4 and 14 or 14, 16. This kind of gives me some information to know if you have an aggressive myeloma, just how aggressive we need to be back. Um, so it really helps me understand how pushy I need to be when it comes to choosing your next therapy. And also disease burden, how much of it is in your body, as we mentioned. You know, if you have had several new bone lesions, unfortunately, develop or your kidneys have been um, specifically um, affected, we need to be more aggressive to slow that down and, and heal, your, heal your body. But let's think about, if not disease-related, therapy-related. Well, let me think. Well, you had Revlimid and, and Velcade and Dexamethasone, and then you had a transplant, and now Revlimid maintenance, and now it's back. Now what? Okay, well, the Revlimid clearly stopped working, so let's not choose Revlimid as part of our cocktail. Let's try and go to something else. And that's where you can go back to our list of medications that I showed previously and say, all right, these are our options. Sometimes it's important to think, well, we've just been on Revlimid, so let's switch drugs and let's go to a different class of drugs to see if that works better. And let's combine it with a medication that I've never seen before it's because I'm trying to outwit this myeloma here. You know, so everything we're trying to do is outsmart it. So if we think it's becoming smarter, then we have to stay ahead of it. Thinking about regimen-related toxicities. So as I mentioned before, if you've had very bad neuropathy related to prior Velcade use, I'm not going to be pretty excited about trying Velcade again. Um, if you have any heart um, potential dysfunction or um, high blood pressure or have had heart attacks or heart failure, things like that, I'm going to really think twice about whether Kyprolis or Carfilzomib is an appropriate choice for you. Um, if you had been on Velcade for, as maintenance for several years um, before things started inching back, maybe we could say that that class of drugs, maybe that's an option for you. So I, I think there's lots of therapy-specific questions that we need to consider and last but often most importantly is cost you know here we are telling you that you need to stay on medications for months years decades whatever that may be that really takes its toll and thank goodness for all of those companies and um, philanthropic organizations that offer grants to patients to help cover the cost because it's stupidly expensive how these revlimid costs it's just it's just not fair so i, I think sadly i have to say to patients when i'm thinking about um you know, what the side effects of treatment will be, but there's a side effect in your wallet as well. And unfortunately we have to take that into consideration. And then lastly is patient related. So 
So things I think about, what are your other medical problems? How um, do you have rides to get to the infusion center? Do you prefer an oral regimen? Do you prefer an, an injection? Um, do you have an, an, an insurance, excuse me, do you have an infusion center um, nearby? Are you treated by a local oncologist, but um, you go see Dr. Cole in Michigan State and, and it's just too far and too cold there, so you don't want to go back there? You know, there's so many different considerations to think about when you're trying to choose your next, your next therapy. So as I mentioned, you can have that slowly progression, asymptomatic biochemical relapse where you see that on two consecutive M-spike checks, you can see that your M-spike is eking its way up. Maybe we can just watch for a little while, but watch pretty closely. If I've been watching you every three months, now you're getting watched once a month, once a month so that I can catch it so that things aren't changing faster before our eyes. Everyone's different. You may find the asymptomatic high-risk disease is starting to double where the M-spike, as I mentioned, goes from 0.5 to one to two. And then there are those people who come back in and say, doc, my back hurts and, or my leg hurts, or I fell and I have a new fracture or whatever it is. And those are the people that we just have to start immediate therapy on. So strategies, there's different approaches. As I mentioned, we could go back to old faithful. If something worked well for you in the past, maybe it's something we want to think about recycling. So say you had RVD, Revlimid Velcade Dex, got a transplant, had been on Revlimid maintenance. Well, that Velcade worked really well. Maybe we could go with Velcade and we could combine it with some of these new agents. Lots of new agents. Now, remember that a lot of the novel agents have specific criteria outlined by the FDA during their approval that says you cannot use this unless you've had three other drugs before it or four other drugs before it, or you've had all the other drugs and nothing else is left. So there are very specific criteria that we in theory are, are kind of held to. Um, salvage con conventional chemotherapy. Gosh, one of the things I love about my job the most is when a new patient with myeloma comes in and says, doc, am I going to lose my hair? And I say, no, not until the transplant, but at least with Revlimid and Belcade and Dex, like there is, there are so many drugs that are available that don't cause kind of conventional chemotherapy side effects that you see in the movie of hair loss and nausea and vomiting. But there are people that have very aggressive myeloma that need the very aggressive treatment back. And so there are times when we think about saving our big gun in our back pocket and shooting that myeloma down as fast as possible. Stem cell transplant, remember, you did it up front. Many of us, when we take your stem cells out the first time, save another bit for a rainy day. So we can have them in, our, in the freezer. So if we decide that after five years, after your transplant, your myeloma came back, well, I got a couple more left in the freezer, maybe this is a good option for us to think about using again. So it's certainly worthwhile talking to your doctor about that. And clinical trials, you all have all these medications available to you because of the super brave people that ahead of you decided that they wanted to participate in a clinical trial. And clinical trials have still that kind of concern about, am I, a guinea, am I a guinea pig? Am I getting a placebo? None of that is ethical and none of that happens anymore. What I tell my patients is, is if for clinical trial, you are getting the standard of care, well, at least I should say this, I am gonna enroll you on a clinical trial, that you are either gonna get the standard of care, which I know works, or you're gonna get the standard of care with something else in addition to see if that makes it better. So either way, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're giving, you're getting what is normal, or you're getting potentially something that is better. So it's a, it's a win-win either way. So please, please always ask about clinical trials. There are so many good options out there that I would love to be able to give to my patients, but I can't write a prescription for it because it's not approved by the FDA. But if that's available at your cancer center, ask about it because maybe you'd be eligible for a clinical trial. So let's kind of break them down a little bit. So when we think about relapse, we're going to do a combination of medications just like we did in the very beginning. So remember, you have your proteasome inhibitors, your bortezomib or Velcade, carfilzomib, kyprolis, exazomib, nilaro. That's one group of medications. Now, I usually we don't combine two in the same group together. So what you're really trying to do is you're probably going to take one from each of these drug um, classes and combine them together. So whether you do three drugs together or do four drugs together, that is you know kind of up for debate as we speak now. Let's say at a minimum you're taking two drugs, one from each class and combining it with DEX. So whether you have a triplet or a quadruplet, we need that as kind of a backbone together so that we can treat your um, relapsed myeloma. 
So things we've talked about is we know now that doing three drugs is better than two drugs. So we know that patients have better response rates, meaning it works better. We know that it stays away longer, which is all we're trying to do is try and get people progression-free survival. Sorry for the acronyms. The longer progression-free survival is make it go away and make it stay away, right? So the most important thing we can do is that. And if we can make it stay away, then we kick the can down the road until the next newest and greatest comes around on March 27th, 2021 with a CAR-T, you know? So there, are, there is an importance of trying to get deep responses because the deeper they are, which means the more successful the treatment is, the longer it's going to last. So most patients are eligible and should receive at least three medications together. So DEX being one of them plus two others. So and when you're thinking about it, Daratumumab is just the gift that keeps on giving. I would tell you that this is a medication like every other one that was approved after you've had three, four, five plus prior lines of therapy. And we just realized how good it is that it keeps just moving its way to the front. That's how all these drugs get approved. They start off for patients who have no other options. And then the studies keep going where they say, look, it works. It's effective. Why are we waiting? Why can't we do it sooner? And so now we can use medicines like daratumumab and combine it with our old faithful, our new old faithful, I guess I should say, lenalidomide, Revlimid, Velcade, Kyprolis, whatever it is. So it's a little bit of alphabet soup a bit where you kind of just try different cocktails all around. And a lot of it is based on the decision making we talked about previously. What has worked before? What hasn't worked what drug have you not had before? And what side effects do you, have you had from previous drugs that make me need to consider including or excluding one of your options? So a similar drug, a similar chart, I should say, I'll kind of push through this to say that at least historically, you know, when you see our combinations, we can see that the combinations together, Dr. Cole showed a really nice Griffin data showing that patients who are newly diagnosed have 99% response rates. I mean, these drugs originally amylidomide, you know, your carfilzomib, daratumumab, all by themselves have about a 20% likelihood of working. But when you start piling them together, you see they all add up, they accumulate. And so you can really get a sense that medications are um, complementary. They work well together. So using one by itself is really not the way to go. But at least that set the bar for us. So that now we're starting to look at some of these other approaches, the kind of immunotherapy approaches that we're going to touch on next is a way that we can kind of have a bar that we know what we're trying to beat. So as it stands, when we're looking at kind of novel combinations, last year there was a handful of different um, cocktails that were approved. The one that I think has been absolutely the most impactful is the subcutaneous daratumumab. So we used to give this as an IV for eight hours in the first day and you'd hang out and stare at the ceiling and, and, and curse me for making you be there. And now let's just give you an injection over three minutes and get you the heck on out of there. So I think that has been kind of the biggest game changer that um, we've seen in the course of the last year. I really do like the common, the CANDOR study, which was done in patients who had relapsed for their first time or second or third or fourth time and said, if you hadn't had daratumumab, Maybe now we use it and we can combine it with carfilzomib, you know, and that is a nice combination of medications together so that we can um, try that to see if we can get a good bang for our buck. So the Icaria study, just as a quick mention, ESA is our little nickname for Isatuximab is a similar medication to daratumumab in the sense that they both work the same way by finding this little tag on the myeloma cell that says, hey, I'm myeloma cell, come get me. Um, they work very similarly. So when you're thinking about how, you know, we are in general are trying to approach this, you know, my general comments on relapse refractory myeloma, if it's your first relapse or your second relapse or whatever it may be, I, I kind of like to think of it as a Peloton. And I have to give credit to my good friend, Dr. Nina Shaw, who I stole this slide from because she is nothing short of um, um comedian um, to say is that at Peloton, everyone's doing it. The way of the future that we is clear now is, and, and from the di Griffin data and everything that's out there is that CD38 is a very important target on multiple myeloma cells. So why wait? I really think that dar daratumumab should be given as soon as possible for our patients. And then it's just a matter of what do we combine it with? Combining with carfilzomib is extremely effective. 
But that certainly brings up the question, well, if I had daratumumab in the very beginning, what next? So yes, that's the kind of new frontier we're trying to figure out what to do. So a brief mention, and I know that people have very um, strong opinions on transplant and big disclaimer, I am wildly biased because under my title, it will say I am a bone marrow transplanter. I believe in bone marrow transplant until t- someone tells me that there's something better that is going to allow people to live longer and stay in remission longer. So for the people who are worth considering a second transplant are those who did well with the first one and did well, meaning that it was successful. What's success? At least two years. The general guidelines recommend that you could consider a second transplant if the first one worked, meaning that got you down into remission or you had a response to it, and that it worked for at least two years. 18 months feels is a little bit short for me. Two years even still feels a little bit short. That's where I have the conversation to say, because oftentimes the remission after a second transplant is probably about half the time of the first transplant remission. So, and it's a lot, it's a lot to go through with a transplant. So you really want to make sure it's worth your while and weigh it against the other medications that are still available to you that you haven't seen. But wait, there's more. And this is where it gets exciting. So Let's move on. So what is BCMA? So I mentioned earlier about CD38, about having this little tag on the myeloma cells that says, hey, yo, I'm over here. I'm the myeloma. Come on over and and get it. BCMA is similar. So BCMA is one particular flag that is specifically on myeloma cells and not on many other cells. So if we had some form of a medication that had a little radar system, if you think about it, that looks for the BCMA, and basically shot its gun at it or stuck to it or inserted chemo into it or said, hey, immune system, I got them. Come on over and attack. There are really important um, ways that we can take advantage of BCMA. So um, this has kind of been the darling, if you will, of of multiple myeloma in the last um, several years, trying to figure out how we can exploit um, this discovery. So here's one way that we can do it. So antibody drug conjugates. Now, there was a drug that was approved by the FDA last year called Blenrep or Belantamab Mafadotin. How about that for a mouthful? What it is, is it's partly on, I think of it as like an arrow. So if you have a bow and arrow and your arrow's target is that BCMA, it sticks to the myeloma cell, rated that BCMA, and it almost like a needle injects a drug into it. So you can see this little star here. The star is what we call a warhead or a payload. It it basically is a baby little chemo drug that gets injected into the myeloma cell after the arrow part or the antibody sticks to the BCMA. So it finds the drug, it finds the myeloma cell by sticking to BCMA and it injects the chemo into it. Awesome. You know, general chemotherapy is designed to just drop an atomic bomb on the entire body and kills all the bad guys and takes all the innocent bystanders with it. But this is exciting because it's really specifically targeting the myeloma cells and sparing all the good guys. So this was an exciting um, first drug that made it to the finish line that was targeting BCMA to kill myeloma cells. So here it is, belantamab, mafodotin. It's the antibody drug conjugate. Um, It was studied in a a variety of different doses, finally came down to two separate doses, trying to figure out which was the right one that had the most success with the least toxicity. And wouldn't you know what comes with new drugs is new side effects. So here we are, we myeloma doctors are pretty darn comfortable with your immune system. We're pretty comfortable with your blood levels. We know how to manage neuropathy. We know how to manage um, diarrhea from your Revlimib. But when it comes to eyes, this is a whole new ballgame. So the biggest problem we've seen with Belantamab, Mafodotin, is that it affects the eyes, which is hard. I mean, this is a new thing for us. And people can end up having blurry vision that happens as the actual the cornea itself can be inflamed, um, where patients notice that their visual acuity changes, their um, eyes can get dry, they get blurred vision. Um, so this has been a, a new um, side effect that we would ha- that we've had to learn uh, about um, because this is an exciting drug, but certainly needs to kind of make sure that this is watched being watched very carefully. So it actually requires you to see an ophthalmologist before the drug and before every dose, given every three weeks. And if there's any signs of eye um, side effects, then we need to 
your doctor is going to stay in very close touch with your ophthalmologist so we can make decisions about how to not let that worsen. It is almost always reversible, but it means that the drug has to be hold, held so that we don't let things worsen in the interim. So let's get to the patients who it's not their first time they've relapsed, but they've had you know my, their myeloma come back several different times. They've had three different or more combinations of therapy. Now what? So you've made it through all the usual suspects: Revlimid, Pomalis, Velcade, Kyprolis, Daratumumab, Cetuximab. You know it just rolls off the tongue point. So you've had all these drugs, and now what? Well. It's time here, ladies and gentlemen. I feel so honored to do this on the day that it was actually approved. Let's talk about the CARs. So the CARs or the CAR Ts we talk about, this is the thing that is finally here. Our lymphoma and leukemia colleagues have really been able to um, use FDA approved CAR T cells to, as a means to treat their patients' cancers. Well, now it's our turn. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. So very, very broadly, how can we use your own immune system to fight your own cancer? Now, similar to what I talked about, about having BCMA being the target, what this time we're doing with CAR T is we are actually removing your T cells. So T cells are your, are your big immune system fighter cells. They're the guys that are supposed to go out there and seek and destroy. So if I can take your T cells out of you, and the way that happens is very similar similar to the way you got your stem cells removed, for example. So we hook you up to a machine. It's like you're donating blood. The machine separates out the T cells that we want from the rest of the blood, which goes back into you. Well, the T cells then are sent out, mailed to this special lab somewhere, somewhere, and they re-engineer them. So when they re-engineer them, they basically construct them in a way to put that new radar system in it to say, all right, here's your immune system fighter cell. Now I'm going to add a new radar system to it. So it says that, hey, when you see BCMA on that myeloma cell, go attack. So now my immune system is taught to look specifically for that BCMA on the myeloma cell. So once, this, once the T cells are made at this outside lab, they're mailed back to me. I then give your body a small amount of chemotherapy. I would argue that it's um, while two medications that we use together, it is tolerated better, the chemotherapy part, than the transplant is. So there are more patients who can do CAR-T than potentially patients who want to go auto, auto transplant. Um, there's been studies on CAR-T saying that maybe older patients are able to go undergo CAR-T therapy. There are, there are studies that are coming out to say for patients who are ineligible for a transplant, maybe we should do CAR-T up front. So lots coming, but you get chemotherapy as a means to clear out your immune system to make way for the new immune system I'm about to put into you. And then just similar to getting a blood transfusion from your own immune, from yourself, we base T cells back into you and then we wait. And what we're waiting for is those T cells to go to work. And that in and of itself has its own um, complications, I will say, but at least this is how CAR T's generally work. And we'll get into that a little bit. So here it is. It was just earlier this month that I finally um, put forward the, public, the publication in our very important New England Journal of Medicine. I don't even dare to try and pronounce this. We even, myeloma doctors, just say Ida cell. Ida cell, so you can see it's the first Ida and then cell at the end in relapse refractory multiple myeloma was finally published. And this is usually the first step before the FDA approves it. So once this came out, we knew what was coming next. And today was the day that this drug was approved by the um, FDA. And just for funsies, they have a really cool, uh, pretty witty name to it. They call it ABCMA. It's spelled A-B-E-C-M-A, -E just so you know exactly what it is that they're doing. And so that I don't have to say I had a captagene viscous lulisol over and over again to you all. So um, A-B-C-M-A has been approved by the FDA, which is the first CAR-T that uses your immune system to fight your myeloma by finding that B-C-M-A on the myeloma cell. And so how did we get here? Well, what they did is they looked at various doses. So just like medicine has different strengths, we now have CAR T cells that say, well, if 10 immune system cells are put into me, they can probably do a little bit of a job. But what if I put 100? Could they do a stronger job? Think of an army, right? You can have an army, but if you have a bigger army than your opponent, then probably the more, the better. So what they did first is they looked and said, let me put a little bit of cells in, you can see that they have the numbers at the bottom here that comment to say they put 150 million cells in or 300 million cells in or whatever it is and found that 
more mattered. Patients had more myeloma killed with more cells. So ultimately, remember I said that a lot of drugs were getting approved by the FDA when you have um, um, new drugs like pomalidomide and it works about 20% of the time. Oh my goodness, the bar has moved. Here we are looking at overall response rates from patients who have very few other options at 80%, 80. And so really now we're taking one drug or one new therapy and have said that 80% of people are having it work for them. So this is really changing things. Rather, you know, as opposed to the 20 to 30% response rates we saw in a lot of recent drug approvals, this is different. And so th there are a lot of CAR T's out there. Um, it's a kind of bit of a race to the finish line as a variety of different companies have made their own CAR T. So they still take your T cells, they still put the BCMA in it, but they say, if I tweak this or tweak that, then mine's different than yours and maybe mine will work better than yours. And honestly, they're all similar, but slightly different. And that seems like it might matter. So while Idacel was just approved by the FDA and that's that was Bluebird or now Bristol Myers Squibb and um, was the company that got their approval. This is Johnson & Johnson. So the Cartitude study looked at a similar BCMA CAR T, slightly different, but look at these numbers, 97% of people. And that is a staggering number. We're finally seeing patients who have had no other options respond to something. And it happens fast. You can see the median time to first response is one month. So after a month, we're seeing that it already works. And not only that, we're seeing very deep responses. So MRD, I don't touch on much today, but generally, if you think about minimal residual disease, what we are looking for is how much myeloma is left in your system. I can do a bone marrow biopsy and I can do blood tests and see your M spike or see bad guys in your bone marrow. But what if there is so little there that it's only with the fanciest genetic high tech tools that we can count a million cells and find one little smidge of DNA that says, yep, there's still some myeloma here. That is what we do to look for minimal residual disease. And we know that if I can count a million cells and find none, that means you are MRD negative. That means that you're gonna stay in remission longer than someone else will. And so if that matters, then it's important to recognize that if 96% of patients this is working for, 93% of patients that were evaluated in this study had no disease left when they counted a million cells, that is remarkable. So this is really showing us that there is something new and great that is coming up. Now, I see the question from my favorite Tom Tucker that's down there. You know, they're getting approved in terms of progression-free survival times, not overall survival times. So I don't know yet. I don't know in terms of what the overall survival is going to look like um, overall, but hang in there, stay tuned. The good thing here is that patients are living longer and it's taking longer for us to estimate that overall survival time um, because we need to see what happens to all those patients. So here is one, two, three different BCMA CAR T's, and this is just three. These may be the three front runners and, or the ones that are furthest along, but you can see across the board, really remarkable response rates, 70, 90, 100% of patients are having success with these medications and really deep responses, finding that patients are getting to MRD negativity as well. So I, I go into this, a little superficially just to tell you that it's here, but that this is clearly here to stay. And if this is happening with such great results with patients who have had immune systems that have just been beat up, right? All the medicines you got for your myeloma beat up your, your immune system. And now I'm asking your immune system to fight a war. What if I use those you know, early cadets when they're brand new soldiers and say, listen guys, this is how you're gonna, and ladies, this is how you are gonna fight this war. This is, you know, they are armed with more weapons. They are a stronger, less tired immune system that can probably do better work. So maybe eventually what we're going to see is that these are not going to wait until the very um, last line of therapy is a kind of Hail Mary. This is we're going to see starting to move up sooner and sooner. As Dr. Cole said, maybe it'll replace transplant to be determined, but lots to come. So here's just a list, the house of cars. You can see there's a lot of them out there. They all really do quite well. I really just put this up there to show that there's one, two, three, four, five, six that are listed here, all of which have really nice response rates. One has made it to the finish line first. We'll see what happens with the others. 
All right, but last and but not least, the homecoming queen of Ash 2020 was a whole new class of drugs. So here I just finished telling you, let me take my your immune system cells out and I'm gonna re-engineer it so that I can put a new reader system in so I can attack the myeloma cell. That's challenging, it's logistically complicated. You have to wait while they make the cells, which sometimes takes way longer time than we have. What if I had a medication that I could just give to you that works similarly? So the homecoming queen is something called a bispecific T-cell engager, a bite, we like to call it. It's like taking a bite out of that myeloma cell. So we talked about, um, you know, daratumumab, a naked antibody. All it does, there's nothing attached to it. It just sticks to the um, target, whatever that may be. For daratumumab, C, you know, CD38. For drug conjugates, we talked about Glenrep or Belantumab. That is a drug conjugate where the antibody is attached to a chemo, where then you can have the antibody stick to the BCMA and inject the chemo in. Well, the bispecific, I think of it as a two-headed magnet. It's a magnet that basically says, I'm gonna to stick to the BCMA on the myeloma on one side, and I'm gonna to stick to the immune system on the other side and bring those together. So I'm basically bringing the two together so that the immune system can do its job. And so this is a, it's a, a two-headed weapon that brings your immune system directly over to your myeloma so that they can say, hey, this is the guy you're supposed to fight. So that's where bispecifics are starting to come to the picture here. So this is, is what we're trying to do, bring the tumor cell and the immune system together to do the job. So bispecifics, also known as bites. This is just another picture I would say is that BCMA has been our, our main target, but on the target cell down here at the bottom, you can see that there are a couple other targets or different tags on those myeloma cells that are starting to be evaluated and looked at to see if maybe BCMA doesn't do the job, well, maybe we can try and find another target or another drug that could potentially do it. So this, it, there's logistics here. You know, in order to be able, for cancer centers, in order to be able to um, offer these, there is a very um, prolonged uh, certification process process that proves that you are that you are able to do this and that you've experienced doing it and you know how to manage the side effects of it. Um, CAR-T is a really nice option, but there are some barriers. Um, you have to have all your friendly um, um, colleagues that are in the ICU or in or neurologists or whomever it may be that can help you manage side effects. Um, in order to get the T cells made, we send them off to a company and we have to sit there and wait anxiously for a couple months sometimes, hopefully Hopefully that the new one that'll get approved will be down to the three to four week, but that's still, you know, time and cost. This is expensive. You know, so CAR T's I think are certainly gonna play a very important role here, but there are only gonna be a, a, a select certain number of centers that are gonna be able to offer this. So as far as the bispecifics treatment, you know, logistics, these are still only in clinical trials. They are not approved yet by the FDA for the purpose of multiple myeloma. Um, we need to try and figure out how well they work. It's nice that I can prescribe it tomorrow as part of the clinical trial and get you treated. So you don't have to wait. Antibody drug conjugates, I can prescribe that tomorrow as well, but we have to learn these new side effects with the eyes. All of this is expensive. So lots of bispecifics that are out there kind of rushing to the finish line also, all of which that are seeing really remarkable response rates, just like with the CAR-Ts, we're seeing patients who have had very few other remaining options, finding that we're having 50, 60, 80 plus percent response rates in patients and really feeling um, you know, pretty satisfied with these responses. A very brief mention on CRS. So CRS means cytokine release syndrome. So if I am telling your immune system to go to work and go to war, the immune system is really good at fighting the bad guys. And the way it does that is it basically brings, it recruits its more, more fighters to the fight. It grows its army. And when it grows its army, they get activated and they start arming themselves with all these tools and they start bringing their guns and knives and lead pipes and ropes to the, to the, to the battle. But when they do that, it can really cause side effects for the patient that can um, really happen from tip to toe. Um, it can look like patients are having a very um, having an infection. They can have big fevers, blood pressure changes. They can have, um, in really severe cases, um, can be scary and look like patients are having strokes or seizures, things like that. And so, 
Um, it really takes very experienced people to be able to know how to care for patients who are undergoing CAR T. Um, and by specifics, because however you're stimulating the immune system, you can see this. And so there are different approaches. We can actually have medications as almost, let's say, antidotes to just calm everything down. If these guys are bringing all their weapons to the battle, we may say we need to get the troops to sit down for a bit. And there are means of doing that. We can use steroids that tells the immune system, the T cells to just calm down. Um, there's varying degrees or aggressiveness of treatments or antidotes that all depend on the aggressiveness of the reaction. Um, I mentioned this a little bit, you know, there are neurotoxicity, the T cells sometimes can cause neurotoxicity, which as I mentioned, can look and be scary, but look like strokes, seizures, things like that. They are self-contained, they resolve, um, but it can be very scary to watch. Logistics, we kind of mentioned a little bit. I'm going to move along because I think I'm getting towards the end. But we talked about how they're manufactured. We talked about the trial that did it that finally brought us to where we are today with the approval process. And then think about logistics. And what's nice about a CAR-T is that we can do one and done. If I can give you one CAR-T, I hope that it will provide prolonged remission times where you can be off of treatment not need Revlimid maintenance, not need some of these drugs. There are logistics that have to happen in order to get us there. But um, this is an opportunity to potentially to give you a treatment and then take a nice long vacation from it. Does not look curative yet, but to be determined what's going to happen when we start using patients whose immune systems work a little bit better when they've been diagnosed sooner or treated earlier in their disease course. Um, the practical you know, components of using a bite is the same thing as you have to have experienced centers. You have to be prepared for that cytokine release syndrome. But these drugs you have to keep giving. And so um, that can be a problem, an Achilles heel in the sense that you just end up having to give weekly or biweekly infusions, whatever it may be. So it doesn't do the same thing that CAR T's are where it's one and done. But the fact that I can prescribe this and give it to you pretty quickly and move along just kind of adds a new um, weapon to our arsenal. Biggest question is any of this going to make me feel any better? So, you know, we will figure this out. What we know is that if we compare it to patients who've had kind of our standard treatments, Mammoth was a, a study that was done that looked at a variety of our different kind of treatments that we're already well familiar with. It looks like patients are being treated with um, CAR-T are potentially living longer than those who are using kind of the usual suspects at this point in their disease course. Same with progression-free survival. I think, you know, your conventional treatments versus what we have now for patients with very advanced disease really looks like this is going to be an important tool in our arsenal. Um, and it, it matters. People feel better. When they, when they did studies on patients and asked them how they felt while they were going through this, they noted significant improvements in emotional functioning and social functioning and just physically feeling better. And so, yes, you're going through pretty rigorous treatments, but at the ultimate endpoint and what is, I think, most important, the quality of life. And patients found that there was an immediate improvement for those patients who um, received these treatments. And across the board, really seeing that patients had improvement um, more so than they had side effects. So while the side effects may be scary, ultimately, this is up to nine months after the therapy, patients were overall were feeling better across the board. So conclusions. So lots of coming, including today, with really impressive response rates, with unprecedented remission periods. Um, patients are feeling good. They're feeling good and they're getting better. Uh, yet to be determined what the insurance companies think of all of this. And as I mentioned, not curative yet, but my hope is, is that we're going to see that all of these are moving closer and closer to diagnosis, where we are going to see um, much more improved outcomes overall. So with that, thank you for listening to me drone on a bit. I hope that that was helpful and not overwhelming and not too fast.